Hi there, it's Frank Foley again with another little literary takeaway for you. This one's Dante and the Lobster, short story by Samuel Beckett, um, published in this collection, um, brilliantly titled More Pricks Than Kicks, um, published in 1934. Love this short story. Um, read it, came across it in um, the first year at uni. It was in the summer, everybody else had gone home and I was just kind of wandering through the, u the uni library and I came across it. We'd studied Endgame, found this collection and um, you know, just loved this story and it really got me the ending. I've never forgotten it. Um, so, you know, I thought it would be a good one to do. Um, not going to go into the kind of academic side of Beckett and his relationship with Joyce and, you know, the allusions to other texts and everything. I'm just kind of try and talk about the story for, you know, in terms of where it goes itself. So I like to look at kind of structural points in stories and try to get an, an idea of where things move on. Sometimes writers put text breaks in, um, which is really helpful because that does divide the story up into sections. Um, Beckett does this with this. So there are three sections and there are, you know, there are two text breaks which kind of divide it up nicely. Sometimes the text breaks aren't there, but you can kind of see structural points anyway. Um, but yeah, Beckett puts the text breaks in. So what you've got basically is a um, young adult called Balakwa and he is struggling, he's very bright, um, he's struggling with the Divine Comedy. He can't kind of, you know, uh, make sense of the text, the part of the text he's reading, which is the purgatory bit with Beatrice. And he's not getting anywhere. The point is he's stuck. Um, and he he starts thinking about the rest of his day and he breaks that down into three things that he has to do. Lunch, get the lobster for his aunt, and then he has to do an Italian lesson. So he's got that structure and he's like, right, now I'm going to move on. And this first section, which is actually the longest part, is much longer than the other two sections. The first part is him. So moving away from studying the Divine Comedy to um, going to get his lunch, preparing his lunch. And he goes to get and it's really, really great because it's very precise in terms of how Beckett lays, you know, this young lad making his lunch, which is going to be basically a gorgonzola on got a toasted gorgonzola sandwich <laughs> it's really funny that the precision that he goes to is is kind of uh you know almost military precision he goes and buys this really stinky piece of gorgonzola um and then he he toasts the bread and said it's black and then he puts this together and you know and and uh it's it's, it's brilliant and i'm just going to read a couple of bits here there you know there's things like beckett just uses words so amazingly so there's there's this um if there was one thing he abominated more than another it was to feel his teeth meet in a bathos of pith and dough um and there's another one which is just over here he lowered the gas of suspicion and plucked one flabby slab plump down on the glowing fabric. Um, <laughs> I love the way Beckett uses language, it's so cool. Anyway, so he moves on to, um, so he has his lunch and he moves on to um, the Italian lesson. Um, um, no, he buys the lobster, I beg your pardon. He goes to buy the lobster and the story's ending revolves around the way we cook log lobsters, and I'm actually gonna, I'm I'm gonna give you a warning, but I really want to read the end of this story because I I don't know it's it's probably not in the public domain and you might not read it, so I'm I'm uh, I, but I think it's so worth listening to, so I'm gonna try and read it. It might not work, but we'll see how we get on. Um, so he goes to buy the lobster. Moving to the second phase of the story, he goes to buy the lobster. Um, the 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 the. The, the shopkeeper kind of hints that it's a fresh lobster. So what we know about cooking lobsters though, is that we boil them alive. Um, and, but Belacqua doesn't know this. You know, it's another one of those stories about a young adult finding out the way the world works. Um, Belacqua doesn't know it's alive. So he goes to his Italian lesson with the lobster in a bag um, and he does his Italian lesson. There's a bit of banter with the, with the tutor. Um, her cat tries to get the lobster, um, but, you know, that's not successful. And then Balakwa goes to his aunt's with the lobster. And, um, you know, the, he describes her. She's old. She's got a parchment -y kind of face and everything like that. Um, and then 
it's really the final page, the final page and a half where the story kind of like just turns into something slightly different. Um, I'm going to read. So basically what's happened is, is um, they get the lobster out and what, and, she, and the aunt puts it on the table and it moves and Balakwa can't believe it. it's alive. It's alive. Oh my God. What are we going to do? And the aunt's like, of course it's alive. That's how you cook lobsters. He's horrified, absolutely horrified. So I'm just going to try this. I'm not the best reader of stories in the world, but I'm just going to read you the final bit. And, you know, this is a spoiler. Um, I wouldn't normally do this because I, I'd encourage you to go and read it for yourself. But, you know, it's a tough story to get hold of, I think, to be honest. It's not, as far as I know, not very well anthologized in, you know, in, in different collections. So I, I, I'm i going to read it and I'm, hopefully I can do it justice. But so Balak was found out that the lobster's alive and, and, and this is how it goes. All this time, muttered Balakwa, then suddenly aware of her hideous equipment. What, what are you going to do? He cried. Boil the beast, she said. What else? But it's not dead, protested Balakwa. You can't boil it like that. She looked at him in astonishment. Had he taken leave of his senses? Have sense, she said sharply. Lobsters are always boiled alive. They must be. She caught up the lobster and laid it on its back. It trembled. They feel nothing, she said. In the depths of the sea it had crept into the cruel pot. For hours in the midst of its enemies it had breathed secretly. It had survived the Frenchman's cat and its witless clutch. Now it was going alive into scalding water. It had to take into my air my quiet breath. Belacqua looked at the old parchment of her face, grey in the dim kitchen. You make a fuss, she said angrily, and upset me and then lash into it for your dinner. She lifted the lobster clear of the table. It had about 30 seconds to live. Well, thought Balakwa, it's a quick death. God help us all. It is not. That just gets me every time. It really does. Um, I don't know. There's something just... Great literature works at levels, doesn't it? It works at it, the individual level. But it, at the same time, it, it speaks universally. It speaks to something bigger than us individually. It speaks to something, whether you want to call it collective spirit or whatever, whatever your term for that is, whatever humanity is, literature is able to, to, to cross those boundaries, to transcend just individual experience while giving a, an, an, doing an amazing job of representing the experience, but then being able to say something much bigger than that as well. And for some reason, just that, those final paragraphs there, they say kind of so much about the human condition and the condition of life, I suppose, and, and the struggle between life and death. Um, brilliant short story. If you can get a hold of a copy of it, I really recommend you read it. I don't know if it's in the public domain, but I will, if it is, I will link it uh, as I try to do. Um, Dante and the Lobster, published in 1934 by Samuel Beckett. If you get a chance, give it a read. Brilliant short story. And thanks very much.